that are going to introduce you, uh, to introduce us in two of the most exciting initiatives where citizens are taking control of the way they want health services to be provided and the way they want their health care to be thought of. Mm? So we'll start with Giovanna. Giovanna, will, uh, can you please describe the project you're working at at this time, please? It's open, it's open. It's open. Okay, uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. And uh, it was a, such a, a long walk for me because I, I'm living in Paris and I work here. And my project, uh, uh, the huge project is uh, a web platform which is also an organization, a patient organization dedicated to cancer. And uh, the aim of this organization is to, um, to involve or to try to involve uh, um, patient caregivers uh, or people concerned, also citizens, in building uh, the, the healthcare system. And why do we um, work in this sense? Because uh, we are, we are um, pretty persuaded that the people, every, every, every citizen is uh, more or less a potential patient, is more or less a potential caregiver, and is also a contributor. And a cancer is uh, a, a disease which is uh, really democratic. So uh, everyone is concerned about uh, this, uh, this pathology and also about uh, chronic disease which are m more and more present in our society. And so we need to our society to evolve, to uh, change, uh, uh, concerning these uh, issues and uh, we think that uh, people have their word to say to, uh, uh, to authority in order to be a co-designer of this evolution. Okay. We'll talk more further. Could you briefly introduce your project, please, Geraldine? I'd like to start with a personal story. Yeah. Um, there's a story about this kid. He is one year old and he cannot breathe. He w wakes up in the morning and he has trouble breathing. So his mother worries sick and, he, and she takes him to the hospital and the thing gets worse and worse and they have to almost put him with an artificial respirator. But in the end, the problem solves. It takes, I think, 10 days and the mother is happy. The kid is leaving the hospital and so the moment when the mother picks up the phone and asks for the um, clinical data, <gasps> silence, pause. And after a couple of seconds, the voice from the other side of the phone says, for what do you want the data? I'll rephrase. For what do you want the data? That was me. I'm a scientist. And above all that, I'm a mother. That data belongs to me. That data belongs to my son. I'm just fed up of not having access to information. And I can give you a million stories of a million people, or millions of people that suffer different diseases or that are perfectly healthy and suddenly they just uh, have this amazing illness and they die two days afterwards. What on earth is happening? Why is it that health is still a mystery? So having that in mind, we said, why don't we use the power of crowdsourcing? Why don't we use the power for crowdsourcing, sorry, of crowdsourcing for information that's related to health? Everything is related to health. All your, all your lifestyle, all your genes, and all your clinical information should be together in one place. And why don't we do it? We don't do it because we don't know that we have the power over our, our own data. And that's the way data donors was, store, was um, formed. We envision to have a place, a crowdsourced community, where we can have a global repository of health information. And this information is really available to all, not only to the labs, but for you and for you and any person around the world that has great ideas and want to get the data, crunch the numbers, and make data-driven hypotheses. Thank you so much for this uh, personal story. Uh, I would like to come back to you. Could you tell us about your actual project? You're working with cancer patients, trying to design home services that are equivalent to hospitals, aren't you? Okay. 
So just a, a, a small reaction to, uh, to Geraldine. Uh, it, it's very interesting that um, uh, the, your, um, uh, the, the origin of your project, and I think that um, many of these uh, uh, projects uh, come also from personal stories and from context, because um, I was I was considering that here in uh, in France, uh, the, um, the 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 juridical picture, the juridical frame, uh, allow to people since 2002 from uh, the Kushner Act uh, and 2002 to have the right to get their data. Everyone who is uh, treated in a hospital have, has the right to have his own data, not to, um, to share all the data. Uh, we don't have necessarily a space to share the data. The data are um, conserved by the uh, national assurance and the access to national insurance is not uh, very easy, but anyhow, Everyone here can can get his uh, his own data. Well, <laughs> and um, the the project we are talking about, uh, Javier was talking about, is uh, um, a project we, that we are realizing uh, this year, and it's a project. This is very very important for me because of the methodology, because of the the of the cause, because of the uh, the aim and the goals and the methodology. The goals is. Uh, the, goal, the first goal is uh, to involve, again, people concerned from cancer and especially concerned from home care to um, participate to the design of the evolution that healthcare system in France and in many other countries um, put in place in order to, um, to um, uh, transfer people from the hospital to home. We can consider that it's a very good idea, and it is, for quality of life to be cared at home with the same, um, with the same security and quality of uh, health care. It's wonderful, instead of being to the, in the hospital. And for the health care system, it's very interesting because the cost reduce if uh, they let people back, go back home instead of getting there in the hospital. But since now, every time that I hear from uh, uh, authorities talking about uh, home care, I hear every time the major point, which is economical point. It's the medical economical point. How can we reduce budget in order to, how can we organize differently in order to, but never how can we respond to needs of people, people, uh, patients, caregivers, actors, because everything, everyone is concerned from this uh, uh, deplacement in order to uh, allow people to be better, to, to continue their life uh, in the best way um, po which is possible. So we decided to ask people, and we um, started with a uh, um, um, methodology which is based on the social design. So instead of make a great survey or a you know, great uh, um, etude uh, by uh, anthropologists, by sociologists, and uh, in order to have the good way to do, we, we decided to ask people and to do uh, this, uh, this research with, um, with the, the, the social design. And uh, so we are getting over and over, and uh, we, we hope that uh, we will have uh, some answers, very, very good answers, that will be useful for us to go to the candidate to the, the, the future election next year, and in order to uh, make some lobby and to, uh, to um, involve all the results of this uh, great project to their political uh, uh, issues. Thank you so much. This is a great example of citizens designing the type of care they want to receive at home and trying to lobby the next president or uh, the next president for that to become a standard. No, and I think it's very interesting that standards or what they're trying to do is that standards don't come top down, but standards are settled 
bottom up. No, I'm going back to you, but you said this thing about that we all have the right to our data and so on. I was in eight, uh, 1987 in St. Petersburg, two in the morning. It was the only bar opened in the whole city was within the train station. And you were in the train station in St. Petersburg and you saw lots of people sleeping with their backs. So I asked the people, what were they doing at the station with their backs sleeping when there were no trains? And they answered me that in Russia at that time, everyone had the right to travel, but very few had the opportunity to buy a ticket, no? So that's mainly what's happening with our data, no? Our data belongs to, your, to us, we, are, we don't realize, and no one has told us, but we have the right to our data, but do, we don't have the means, no, to uh, manage our data as ours, no? So what do you offer to us citizens at Data Donalds? Yeah, um, I just wanted to add when you said that here in France, people know that they have access to the, their data. In many countries, they have access to their data. It's, it's by law. You own your information. But one thing is to know it, and one thing is to have access to it, and one thing is to really get it. So I think that's the first like, hurdle we have to overcome. Um, I can see... <laughs> I can list a number of applications where, you know that, for instance, um, th in the same way um, scanner scans the sky to see the weather we have, there are scanners that go through your social media platforms and can map the type of illnesses there are over certain areas. So basically, you can know when the flu is coming to where you live, and you can move away from it. So I can give you millions of examples, and this shows how crowdsourcing works. And why is it important? Because we're saying that that kind of data, the doctor doesn't have it. Now, imagine this. Imagine when you go to the doctor, and he has the clinical data, and he asks the typical questions. Give me one question the doctor asks normally, one from the audience. An example, do you exercise? And what do you say? Yes. Do you eat? Sorry? Do you? Do you smoke? No. Do you eat well? Very well. So those are three discrete points of information with all your clinical data. And the doctor has to put all that information together and come up with a perfect solution for you. But that's not true. What if now you go to the doctor and when he says, do you do exercise? Yes. And then you get your phone and he says, oh, but you only walk 2,000 steps uh, a week and you're supposed to walk like 5,000 steps a day. And do you eat well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But hey, you're eating like 5,000 calories per day. So the whole picture changes. So I want to show you that all that lifestyle makes your genes turn on and off. And that information, you have it. Yes, do you have a computer here in the room? How many of you have a computer? Lift your hands. Good. How many have a tiny computer with you? Show me your computer. Come on. Thank you. Those phones disguised as computer. Do you know how many sensors they have now? Around six. And this is going to grow exponentially. Do you know the amount of data that's there. Do you know, what happens if we put that information together? Don't you think patterns will be changed? And now multiply variables, people, and time. So um, when I ask you, what causes cancer? And some of you will say, what causes cancer smoking? What causes cancer drinking too much wine? What causes cancer eating too much fruit? I can give you the same number of studies that say the opposite. And that's happening because studies are made only on 20 people, 100 people, 150 people. Now. Let's grow that. Let's start analyzing information, but from millions of people. There's not a single study that has assessed a million people in 10 years, for instance. And we can do this. We can do this if we unleash the power of our data. And the only way of doing it is if we say, what if we de-identify the information and do a whole huge cloud of that available to all and not keep it here in your pocket? Thank you. I think it's very interesting to realize that uh, when we're talking health, we're not only talking clinical, we're talking lifestyle. And I think that's important for service design, no? Because, I mean, when you're doing service design with citizens, it's not about the actual clinical action, but there are a lot of agents and a lot of care involved in that. Yeah. 
and uh, for also for reacting to, to Geraldine, I think that it's very, very interesting uh, to uh, think research, to think data for research. It's less, uh, it's less um, acceptable for me to think uh, data for uh, control. And the risk, the risk that you uh, were evoking is uh, to, um, to control people, if you say, uh, well, you didn't do it very well, you didn't, you didn't stop uh, smoking, you didn't, I mean, this kind of data, if they own to, 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 the, to the person, to the individual, it's important that the individual can choose if he wants to show them to everyone, to his just, doctor, just, just to... Just a second, just a second, following, <laughs> no. Because she said something very important. You're co-designing services with citizens. Do you ask them whether they smoke, whether they exercise? Would the services you're co-designing with citizens would become before better if they had not discrete information, but real information about how much are they smoking, exercising, or how are they eating? No, of, of course, uh, citizens, they can be, uh, uh, they can be uh, influenced about um, from knowing all these, uh, all these arguments, and, and, and that's great, that's great. I was just saying to, to pay attention not to uh, translate the huge amount to the case, uh, to, to the, the individual case. I do believe we have to focus on the individual. Um, who's the major stakeholder of your health? My health, I'm, I'm the major stakeholder. Who cares more about my health than I do? So for me, Doctor paternalism is done. It is over. This is a revolution of health, a, a health riot where decisions are not taken only by doctors. It's my life. It's my body. And I want to be part of it. And if I'm not willing to share my data with my doctor, who's going to take a decision over my body, then I believe we have a problem. So nobody wants to take the drugs. People want to be healthy. Why? Because healthy it's better, it's cheaper, and will give you better quality of life. So if you don't start taking up, uh, uh, taking decisions that will affect your health, nobody will do it for you. So people can decide for you, but you have to decide first. You want to react on this? <laughs> I think that it's very theoretical. That's, that's great, it's very theoretical. If everyone could uh, act as if uh, he knew that what is important for him and for his health, that would be great. But we know that, it, that there are elements in society, inequalities, culture and social culture inequalities, who push people to have uh, um, behaviors who are not always uh, the correct behaviors. But for this, I think that what is important is education. It's not control, it's education. It's not theoretical. Check a look at patients like me. They, ha they are grouped by different diseases and they decided to group themselves according to every disease. And for instance, for cancer, they share the different protocols. And you know what? Some decided not to take the protocol that the doctor said and they ended up living more. So it's not theoretical, it is happening. Yeah, but this is for patients, of course. Patients, and especially chronic patients, they are very concerned. They, they know what is good for them. And they are I'm completely, uh, I completely agree with you. And in general, they want to have information from peers and not only from doctors. So this is very, this is true. What I was saying that patients are in, with a, they have an interest, a special interest to, uh, to, kit, to, to, to give up with the disease or to stay the more uh, longer uh, in, in a good quality of life. What I was, oh, I was talking about citizens, about well-being people, and that, that's the point, well-being people are not always concerned but, from health. But Giovanna, do you have any concern about citizens owning their data and having a personal repository of the data they can share with anyone they want in the... No, I think that uh, the, the good issue of data, the, um, the important issue of data is, uh, is great. I mean, for research, for evolution, it's, it's great. 
with uh, a special attention of the use of data because I don't want uh, to think that uh, the citizens' data are um, abused from insurance, from, uh, I mean, I don't want so, to... So, very interesting. So, I'm sorry. How, no, no, because uh, this is getting interesting. What's your policy about sharing uh, citizens' data, data donors? What do you think? I know, um, but I want the people, uh, people to know. Answer me, it's, it's just, I believe people should share their information. The information is out there. You're sharing just for the fun of it. You're sharing tons of information on Facebook, Twitter, or any social media network. If you only knew the value of that information. So let's do it. That's what I say. Okay, I want to go to the next screen, no? And next screen is genetics, no? Our health system is based uh, on symptoms and trying to know what's going on and so on. But uh, genetics is absolutely digitized. You can have 23andMe analysis for $100. It's not a complete genome, but it's good enough to know whether you have a high risk. There are lots of stories of you borrowing your genetic material to your laboratory and then patenting your own gene, no? So that's where data become transcendental. No, how do you see genetics coming to change the way we think about health and the way we think about health data especially? It's a tricky question. Um, yeah, genes cannot be patented because the, the whole genome is from, it's for the universe. What I know is that, for instance, I did the 23andMe a couple of years ago because I'm a guinea pig and I like to do it. And I ended up signing a contract that, a 10-page contract. Of course, I donated my soul to them. And yes, and last year, I found out that Genentech was bought by, 23andMe was bought by Genentech. So basically, they have all my data and they can do whatever they want with that. And I'm not sure I'm very comfortable with it. But as a scientist, I say, okay, if I, they can come up with better options for better treatments, then... Let's do it. And also, regarding to one of your comments that you said, healthy people are not very into health. I'm not sure about it. I like to track a lot of stuff about me, very personal stuff, and I like it. Why? Because people like to compare themselves. Why on earth they, they are tweeting about what they run, what they eat, with whom they are dating? There's a lot of doubt about your health. That's, you do not consider it part of your health, but it is part of the health. And people are sharing. Why? Because people like to compare themselves to others. And now, what if you could find a community where you could compare yourself and see the other choices, the choices that the other people are making, and they, and they are describing those choices as better choices to improve the quality of life? I would go for it. Any comments? I think it depends from education, from uh, people education. Uh, there, and, and we know that uh, people belonging to high levels uh, of society, of education, they react much better than people um, belonging to a, a low level of education. So what is important for me is uh, especially to, um, f to let people emerge and let people be educated the more, the, the more and more and not to, um, to uh, push to, um, uh, to deep. Yeah to deepen the, you know, the difference between I completely people. agree with you, and education is the first step we have to um, overcome. But then again, if you take a look at the data donors platform, the idea is to democratize health information. And how do we do that? If we make a global repository of health info available to all, it means that great pharmas or great laboratories can crunch the numbers in the same way some little person with no education whatsoever in the middle of nowhere can have access to that information and still can come up with great ideas and great hypotheses. So... And I would say we're at a time where culture and convenience uh, work in a different way, like how fast has we got adapted to go to sleep to someone else's house? And we weren't educated for that, but it's so convenient and so easy. And there's so many testimonies that that works better in, in some occasions, no? So I think we are uh, but still there's fa a fast convenience and better alternatives make our society change mass fast, much faster than we had ever thought. In general, this is uh, uh, this answers to an interest. I mean, if uh, being alive is interesting, uh, yes, mm -hmm. of course. But well, in this in this uh, idea, 
all the the the, 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 the tobacco the tobacco factories would be closed. So why people still keep on f f smoking? Because this responds to to something that they need. I mean, and this is the point: is work on what? Why do they do this? Yeah, they keep smoking because smoking is an addiction, and then the same way you you are addicted to other stuff. The idea is: what if? You know what? I'm just tired of listening um, from the TV. There is a study that uh, says that if you drink one glass of wine, it's equal to jogging one hour a day. There's a study that says that coffee cures cancer. There's a study that says that if you fart too many times during the day, that's less probable that you have cancer. There's a study, there's a study, there's a study. It's so distorted, those urban legends. And it's time to stop all that. And, it, and, and I know that the, the hurdle is education, but there's a great educator called Sumatra Mitra where he just put, for instance, a TV with internet to an indigenous population and with nothing else, and he left it there for two months, and then he came back, and the, um, the population knew how to uh, interact with a computer with no explanation whatsoever, and were even learning how to uh, um, speak in English so they could uh, go on and search for more stuff. So education is changing also with this digital and this uh, exponential power um, of the... Of <sighs> The computational power, sorry, growing exponentially. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think it's clear from the debate so far that we are in transition, that we're all aware that we have more rights to our data, more capacity to influence the standards on which health systems are delivering services, be it at hospitals or at home, that we see there are conflicts because we're in transitions and we don't know uh, how this will end. But I would like to open the floor to any questions we might have. So please raise your hands, and Albert will be dissipating the mic. Hi. I would like to, to know how you manage the privacy of the data in data donors. Yeah, privacy is a very important um, thing to think about. Of course, at data donors, we, we encrypt the, the data, so we, you cannot have access to the personal information. And um, if I were to uh, use applications and medical devices, I will always, uh, now, I try to find uh, devices and apps that have open API, so I'm sure that the data is open and freely and anyone can download the information. And they have uh, also good consent forms where I know exactly with whom they are sharing my information. And so I can decide whether to join them or not. Just before the next question, who would like to co-design the whole services they're receiving? Who would like? Who would like to have their health data, clinical data, lifestyle data, genetical data on a personal repository? No, so we're prepared for that. Uh, on a personal repository. I have another question here. I'm just curious if attempts have been made to work together with physicians and academics and citizens. Um, like you're a scientist, so you, you know, you're smart, you have that knowledge, but you think about the training that a physician goes through or an academic, they have that. So it seems to me that maybe there's a solution where they can work together with citizens. That, I think that one of the solutions is what, um, my co-speaker said before, but um, um, uh, very self-explanatory um, endeavor that's going on. I don't know if you heard about ResearchKit. Do you know about ResearchKit? Apple has created a framework for scientists and doctors called ResearchKit. Basically, it's a couple of templates, yes, where any researcher can design their own experiment and will help enroll their patients into this um, experiment or, or it's not an experiment. Imagine you're a doctor and you wanna ask a couple of questions and follow up your patients. The success of this um, project was so huge and you have um, apps for Alzheimer, for postpartum depression, for breast cancer, for melanoma, and for a couple of more that they um, launched a couple of, of months ago, CareKit. And CareKit is for another framework for developers that want to develop any 
app that's related to lifestyle or well-being so that people can just start writing down or, or tracking what they want in order to make better uh, decisions to improve their quality of life. Maybe Giovanna would like to, to, to comment on how physicians and uh, hospitals are co-designing services with citizens uh, as well. Do they play the game? Yeah. Well, l last year we had, uh, we had a project. It's not a genetical project or a data project, but it's an organizational project. Um, the uh, regional uh, agency of health asked us to, uh, um, to, um, repon to, to answer to the question, how do we better offer uh, the healthcare to citizens in this uh, in this territory, which is the Ile de France uh, region, and um, how um, how can we do, especially in in cancer care? So we we asked to uh, to people we launch uh, um, a call for witnesses, and we uh, collected uh, 250 stories about people. And so we analyzed the, the history of people and we found the, the point of, um, of, uh, of the obstacle, the point of difficulty for the, the journey of people. And uh, we um, collected them and we gave, gave them to uh, the, uh, this authority, to the, um, to the um, agency. And uh, they engaged themselves to put all these uh, contents into their strategical projects. So this is a way for us to, um, to avoid the authorities, to, uh, to stop the authorities, to listen only to the professional. Because in general, what happens in healthcare that is that um, only professional, they know what is the good for patients. But we don't ask to patients directly. So that's what we do in general. And just a, a reaction to, to <laughs> again, no, just in general for the question of data and uh, for genetical, for genetical uh, research, I just wanted to, to ask you who, who in, in this uh, room is ready to accept to have the, the answer the, of his uh, uh, genetical picture. I mean, is everyone ready to read on a paper which, kind of, which is the risk to be exposed to a, a, a huge, or huge or grave disease? I think that, okay, but there is an ethical point of view that we need to, uh, to, 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 to think about, to discuss. We have a quick reaction here to this comment and then the last question and we'll need to. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for the information about the apple. That's wonderful. And I'm getting the sense that like there's a, it's a little bit disruptive in the ap approach. Like let's try it with the citizens and then, you know, because maybe n not is enough happening. Um, just to give a bit of context, I'm from Toronto in Canada and I work as a physician leadership coach. So I'm working with doctors who want to make a difference in the healthcare sector. And so that's why I was, my question was coming about working together. And just to give you another example, one of my physicians, like his project, they do these action learning projects, his project is about parking. If you think about going to a hospital, I don't know what it's like here, but it's expensive, it's preventative, and he's got a whole survey going with patients, so really connecting. So I just hope that it can come together, but I, I'm here, I love hearing what you've been sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Last question. Last question. Uh, my question is about the research kit uh, also ap application. I totally agree on, on the fact that uh, the patient should uh, own his own data and use it for himself. But I'm a bit worried, some, maybe bit, um, with such an app, because if you put your data in a research kit, who owns the data? Is it you or is it Apple? And why do Apple want your data, you know? And what is the use of it? No, Apple has nothing to do with it. Apple only created the scaffold 
just a template where the scientist, the doctor can come up with a study they want, they plan, and, and they design it, and you own the information, and there's a very, very, very clear consent form of who owns the data, what are they doing with the data, with whom they're sharing the data, and what's going to happen when you decide to um, withdraw your participation from that. So it's well thought. I promise you, you should go up <laughs> there and, and, and watch the consent form. And, and one more thing, I, did want to, I do want to agree with Giovanna in one point that what's happening now is that we get to rate the quality of our health. And this is happening now. And, and this is the only way we can make doctors that are not very keen in starting uh, with this new developments, and new digital era, to, to stop and think that we are, the, it's our health, and they have to start and think and, and like put, them, put themselves in our position. Uh, to finish with, one sentence, why should, how would the whole health system improve if we citizens designed the services? I think that it's not a question of how, it's the only way that the health system can improve with the, uh, with the, 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 the citizens. I mean, if uh, the system doesn't, uh, um, doesn't involve the citizens, it will go through a wall because the citizens and the patients are the protagonists, the, the main characters of the health system. Is it the only way? Is there another way? Both ways are interesting. How would the health system change no, if we patients or uh, citizens owned and managed our data? I just want to have it. And if I want to use it, I'll use it. And if I don't want to use it, I don't. Perhaps you don't need it now. Perhaps you don't need it in five years' time. But perhaps in ten years' time, there's something wrong. I just want to have it there. You don't, you don't want your doctor just to look at one blood test and one x-ray and just tell him that you do exercise all the day. I want to have it. Okay, thank, thank you so much, Giovanna. Thank you so much, Geraldine. Thank you, everyone. See you again.